Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, this has been a journey for me this week. Uh, I've been, I knew before we went to Pennsylvania a couple months ago or a month ago that a uh, pastor was going to be gone, and uh, he had asked me to fill in for him, I think, right after we got back. So I've had time to prepare, but invariably, as you study these uh, parasha out, things tend to not go the way you want them to go because he has control of things. And uh, so I've had a, had a fun time following the path that he wanted, that I feel like he wanted me to go today. Um, Noah is the title of our parasha. There's a lot of really interesting uh, parts to this story. Um, my, the first place I want to go, I want us to really focus on, is in the, the first chapter in uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. I want us to look at a couple of Hebrew words. Um, when Julio was reading from the, the Torah scroll this morning, and he started reading through this part, and he covered uh, this, this one particular part, he said, uh, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Those two words, just and perfect, are the ones I want to look at. Zadik Tamim. Now, if you really want to look these up, if you're taking notes and you want to look these up when you get home and really get a deeper definition of them, uh, Zadik is the Hebrew number in strong, 6,662. Six, 6, so you can jot that down. And Tamim is the Hebrew word 8549, 8,549. So if you want to look those up, you have the numbers now. But they really are translated where, well in this passage. Um, just, tzaddik, could be better translated as a righteous man, one who walks rightly with God. Um, and perfect, tamim. That's what it means. It means he was perfect, he was complete. That's a lot to say about somebody. These two words are probably the greatest praise that anyone could ever hear from God. Noah was righteous. And he was perfect. That's a lot to live up to. I mean, here God has taken this entire generation of people that he describes as corrupt, if you move to Genesis 6, 11, it says the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. Two more words we want to look at. Corrupt. Hebrews no, the Hebrew number 78, 43 is given to ruin. It's this, the entire earth was ruined, is what God is saying here. Given to, it, is, it was corrupt and filled with violence. This one really struck me when I looked this word up. Because this word literally means Hamas. That is the Hebrew word for violence. It's Hamas. And that's the, if you don't believe me, Hebrew number 2555. And its literal definition is cruelty. It is just, the entire earth was filled with cruelty towards one another. And because of this, God said, there's nothing I can do with it. There's only one family that's worth saving, and he walks perfectly before me. Um, the sages have actually likened the story of Noah with Psalm 1, verse 1. Um, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Now, I, I believe when this was written, that what's going on here is we're trying to see a picture of perfection and what it takes to get that way. Because the entirety of Torah is to bring us to God. And the only way you can stand before God is to be perfect. That's hard. Because he's given us his 613 mitzvot. That is a life-defining moment. And they are, they're actions, they're not passive things. I uh, like how uh, the, uh, I've heard it taught that, you know, one of the teachers in Yeshua's day said that 
to keep Torah, you should not do to someone what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Well, that's very passive. That's not very... I mean, Hebrew is a verb-driven language. It's an action-driven language. Why would we put a passive thing like that out there? Yeshua took that, and he made it even better. He said, you, sh you should do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. See the difference there? I can sit in this chair and not do anything and not treat anyone the way I wouldn't want to be treated. Yet Yeshua puts us into the world and makes us active in it. To fulfill what he's saying, we have to go out and do. And that's really, I believe, what Noah was all about. Because to do what God wants us to do, we have to be active. To be perfect before him, we have to be active in our faith. Psalm 1 lists three wicked types of people. And I think these can be seen in Noah's day. You have ungodly, you have sinners, and you have the scornful. Now you have to understand, Noah, he lived a long time. He actually saw uh, Adam's grandson, Enosh. And we're going to start there with these three types of people. Because Enosh was an ungodly man. He was the first one to institute the, uh, the practice of idolatry in the world. Well, idolatry means you're worshiping something other than God. So therefore, you're being ungodly. And that is one of the, uh, the chiefest things that, just, that started the downfall of after, uh, after, this, after Adam when his line started to decline, if you will. Yet, Noah chose not to follow these idolatrous, ungodly paths. And he decided to stay in the path where he would follow his life and lead it into righteousness through God. Um, the generation that seems to encompass the majority of this Torah portion is the generation that was wiped out in the flood. Well, the simple description of them being totally and completely debased and violent towards one another is a picture of them being fully immersed in their immorality. It didn't matter to them at all what they did to anyone else because it was all about me. Does that sound like any other type of time period in history we know about? Yeah, yeah this, it seems like we're just repeating the same things over and over again until God can wake his people up, I guess. And that probably is, not, I would say that's not going to happen until Messiah comes back. That this, that this world really sees the peace that God wants his people to walk in. But continuing on, after the flood, we see yet that third group of people, the scornful. Because what happened? You know, after several generations, here comes people that just don't even care about God. They build a tower with the sole purpose to climb the tower into the heavens and dethrone God. If that's not scornful, I don't know what is. Yet, we're right here again today. In this day and age, we have those same scornful people that want to not physically build a tower and try to get into heaven. We know that's not physically possible, but they're trying in every way, shape, and form to take his name out of everything and take his authority out of everything. And unfortunately, I'll say it's our fault as believers because we refuse to stand up. You know, I'm going to pick on you a minute, Carl. Yeah. I figured you'd let me. God has given us a sign, and I appreciate you wearing your kippah today because Carl has got this beautiful kippah. I love this kippah, but it's the rainbow. And God has given this rainbow as a sign that he will never flood the earth again. When did that become the banner for homosexuality? And why did we let it happen? I have a dear friend of mine who is bordering upon militant about the rainbow. And don't even talk to this gentleman if you don't want a 45-minute dissertation on this is God's, not the enemy's, because he will give it to you quickly. And I wish that more of us were like this because, honestly, this is becoming rampant in the world today. You know, honestly, there are very few nations that are holdout on the same-sex marriage issue. 
And I was hoping that we would re remain that way for a while, but, you know, it didn't happen. So now it's going to run rampant here even more than it had before. And it's because we didn't stand up and fight against it. We were not active. We sat down and said, I'm not treating them any way I don't want them to treat me, so I'm doing okay. But no, we were not active. Um, Noah lived in every, through every one of these generations, yet he remained pure, he remained upright, righteous, and he remained tamim, perfect. I want to read a section of Pirkei Avot, which is uh, the sayings of the fathers. Now I'm wishing I had worn the head headphone mic. Pardon me. Um, this is Pirkei Avot 4.1, where Ben Zoma says, which person is wise? He who learns from every person, as it is said, from all my teachers, I grew wise. Um, this is an interesting statement when applied to the story of Noah. Because Noah lived through and learned from all of these wicked generations. Now you're probably saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did Noah learn from these wicked, hateful, ungodly generations? Well, the same way we have to, from mistakes. Now, the best kind of mistake to learn from is somebody else's. We don't want to learn from our own mistakes because that means we've messed up and we've got to fix the problem. But when we see someone else's mistakes and we learn from that, then we can come out the better because we're not the one who had to fix the problem so to speak. Um, if we can just focus on learning from righteous people, great, no problem. But unfortunately, we live in a world where the righteous people are very few and far between anymore. And we should be able to take away, just as Noah did, some wonderful things by doing the opposite of what we see our world turning into. The there are arguments that, well, Noah didn't have 613 mitzvot that he had to live up, with, up to and all of this, and I'm probably going to get some people mad at me when I say this because I know this is going to go out on the web. But this is what I consider the lie of the Noahide laws because I've got the Noahide laws here. Let me go run them down for you. Idolatry is forbidden. Incestuous and adulterous relations are forbidden. Murder is forbidden. Cursing God's name is forbidden. Theft is forbidden. Eating part of an animal while the animal still lives is forbidden. Believe it or not, that has been done in history. Make, and that mankind is to establish judges. The first six of these are negative commandments. The seventh is a positive. That just means don't do and do. That's the only difference in negative and positive. However... Even though some of these are, actually all of these are in Scripture, they're never explicitly listed as, okay, these are for the world, these are for the Jews. Never. You'll never find it. People use Acts 15 to justify, where they say, give them the four commandments to the proselytes so that they can have fellowship. None of them are there. These are not Noahide laws. Those four are... You know, keep your, keep your uh, sexual relationship pure and don't eat strangled or bloody or blood thing. Don't eat things like that with the strangled, with the blood. There's nothing about this in the Noahide law. It's just not there. So there's other references people use, but I've, I did a probably about three week study on trying to prove the Noahide laws were in Scripture. I can't find it. The first time they're mentioned is in the midrash of the rabbis. Now, I understand that the rabbis have a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding, but this is my foundation, and this is where I'm going to hold. And if God says this is for his people, I choose to be one of his people. So I'm going to follow this, 
and I'm not going to hold to the Noahide laws of man. Um, but Noah did, I believe, learn from the wickedness of the generation surrounding him. And in doing the opposite of what they were doing, and in walking with God, and in learning from God, instead of shunning him and shunning his word and shunning his spirit, then he would have, of course, attained righteousness with God. Now, our Brit Hadashah passage, which I'll come to in a little while, covers all of those who had the faith. What was this faith they were talking about? This faith is, as it says at the end of it, the faith in the promise that was given. The promise that was given, we read about last week. Messiah, he's going to come. I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed, and you shall bruise his heel, he shall bruise your head. That's Messiah. No doubt. Um, we should have such faith, because we've seen the promise. He's come, he has made atonement for our sins, and he has opened the doors to the Father for us. Bless you. I couldn't resist. He has opened that door. He has made a way. He has cleared the path. There is nothing keeping us from the presence of the Father. It's, it's easy to see the promise and make it a little lighter, if you will, when it's already happened. I mean, imagine Abraham. He goes up a mountain with his son, and his little boy looks at him and says, okay, we got wood, we got fire. I don't see a lamb. What are we going to sacrifice? And having the strength to say, knowing that God has said, you're going to kill the only son, the promise that I've given to you, your son, you're going to kill him and give him to me. You know, Paul says, yeah, he trusted that God could, could resurrect him, but I don't read anywhere where Abraham, Abraham had seen that before in history. He was trusting in a promise. And I don't know that I could do that. And I've got two sons. I don't know that I could do that because as much love as I have for God and as much faith as I have for God, I see my children. They're there. They're physical to hold. And my mind sees that more clearly than the promise. And I've seen the promise in Messiah. And I know that there's a resurrection to come. And that doesn't mean I want to give my kids like that. But that's, that's the faith of Abraham. Um... Continuing on, you know what, I'm going to skip over some of my, my passages here. I want to uh, touch on something that's not in my, my scriptures that I gave to you, Duncan. The parasha, the Brihadasha portion ended at 11, uh, Hebrews 11.26. If you look at 27 through 40 in your own time, you'll see that Paul just keeps on giving these uh, mentions of people. He mentions the prophets. He mentions all the, the women whose children had passed away, and they, they trusted God to bring them back, you know, with, uh, the, and just all these different things that happen. And he basically says, how many more references do I need to give you? How many more people do I need to bring up that had this same faith in this promise they hadn't seen yet? And here I am telling you, about the promise we've received. And he continues on uh, to verse, uh, to chapter, I'll set this over here, to chapter 12 of Hebrews. And I don't think that's in my uh, notes I gave you, Duncan, but I'm going to go ahead and just jump over there. 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Messiah Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If we have this great cloud of witnesses, 
Now, for 6,000 years almost, he's had people that have walked in faith on this earth. And they have died for their faith. Several of them, hundreds of thousands of them, have died for their faith. And we live here in America where things are nice and you know, it's rough, but it's, we're not dying for our faith here. You know, we've seen the promise. But so I guess looking back at Noah, at this Tzadik Tamim, this perfectly righteous man, as an example, Messiah came and he walked Torah perfectly. As in our example, how are we going to do this? Are we children of the king? There's only one way we can do it. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 says, I can do all things through Messiah who strengthens me. There's our answer. That is how we do this. And this is where it gets hard, believe it or not. Because yes, in Messiah we can do anything. We can do all the works of Torah. We can walk uprightly. We can walk justly. We can be perfect before God. But there's one problem. It's right here. This skin that we're in. This mind that's in our heads. This tongue that's in our mouths. Give me that word again. Self-deprecating. I'm going to borrow from Paul here, of whom I am the chiefest. <laughs> Self-deprecating is taking all the wonderful things that God has given us in our person that we are, all of our talents, all of our abilities, all of the, the understanding, all of the knowledge, everything that he's given us that we can do for him. And instead of putting it as important in our lives as God has done, we walk all over it. We stomp on it. We tread it with our tongues, with our minds. We think, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I can't stand up in front of people and talk. I can't do these things. Well, God has given each and every one of us a ministry. I never thought mine would be up here. But okay. I thought I would be sitting behind a drum set as my ministry for all eternity. But he proved that wrong when he took it from me. I still get to play a little bit, but it's not what I thought I was going to be doing. I definitely didn't think I was going to be standing in front of people, especially with a camera pointed at me, uh, doing this. But there's something about it, about the ministry that God gives us. That when you get that opportunity, it just comes out. And when you take that feeling, that, that fire that God puts in you, and you cover it, and you stoke it down with, with your own thoughts about yourself, I'm not trying to, pe to preach pride to everybody. I don't want us to be a prideful people. There is a fine line between understanding the abilities that God has given to us and being prideful. Because as Scripture says, pride cometh before a fall. We cannot be a prideful people, but we don't have to beat ourselves up. Because, I'm sorry, that's not what this is all about. I am going to go back to the Haftarah. Isaiah chapter 54, and I'm going to start in verse 4, and I'm going to finish it, that, uh, the, the Haftarah portion through verse 10. And I want you to really focus on what I'm saying here, because this is what God thinks of his people. This is how God thinks about us in this room. He says in verse 4, Do not fear. You will not be ashamed, nor will you be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. You will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. 
Adonai Tzevaot, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. For a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says Adonai, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills shall be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says Adonai, who has mercy on you. Now, we have an accuser. We have one who stands before God and says, but he did this, or she said that. Why do we want to give him more ammunition? Why do we want to keep bringing up our faults and failures? That's his job. That's not our job. Because if we keep bringing them up, then they stick right here. They stay here, and they are what puts the roadblocks in front of us. The Father has not created faulty believers. Not, he has not got faulty children. We mess up. I'll admit it. We mess up. I'm not, nobody in this room is perfect. And if you are, teach us how to do it. But that doesn't mean that we dwell in that. That doesn't mean that if, you, if I sit over here and I get the tempo wrong on a song that I beat myself up about it. No, I either speed it up or slow it down, get back where it's supposed to be, and move on. That doesn't mean that if you're singing and you go a little sharp or a little flat, that you just drop everything and stop and start pouting. No, you get back on key and move on. That doesn't mean that because you have a problem speaking in front of people that you shouldn't try it. And if you mess up, move on. It's not a big deal. You know why it's not a big deal? Because he's our father. He is our king, and he is our husband. And that's the big deal. That's what matters. The little things that we think cause problems for us they're not important at all. He says in Matthew 11, he's in uh, verse 30, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, a yoke is work to do. And a burden is something you have to carry. And it's not usually easy. But his is easy and his is light. That's because he gives us the power. Going back to Philippians again, 4.13, I can do all things through Messiah Yeshua who gives me strength. Do we not believe that? And why do we sit back and let the world take over and everything? Why do we let that snowball that started rolling downhill with Roe v. Wade keep getting bigger and letting them keep constantly taking more and more and more out of our hands for the sake of political correctness? hate political correctness because I'm sorry I got my feelings hurt a lot growing up and I turned out alright I think but <laughs> well the debate will happen during Torah talk and he's in charge uh, <laughs> but the point of the matter is my wife will attest to the fact that no one beats themselves up about their failures more than me but through Messiah, I'm trying to do better. And I'm trying really hard to find that balance between pride and understanding where God has me and what gifts he's given me. And it's a struggle. But that's what we're here for. As a community, we're here to help each other with the struggle. If we can't help each other with the struggle, then what are we doing here together? So that's the point. We can walk upright, and be tzaddik tamim. We can do it. 
Scripture tells us all throughout that we are His and that we can do it because we are His. So everybody says, oh, well, you know, all the 613 commandments, that's too hard. No, it's not. And that, I mean, I don't need proof. If it was too hard, He wouldn't have given us 613 commandments to follow. Because He's not going to make it too hard. He says His yoke is easy, His burdens are light. That doesn't sound like it's too hard to me, because I'm sorry, if He is Messiah, if He is the Torah that walked on earth, that's our burden, is the Torah. And if it's so light we can carry it, we can do it.